the author. I kind of had always dreamed that I could make the Lord of Rings movies. I uh, missed that opportunity. <laughs> Peter snatched that one in the closet. Um, and as the series coming. Exactly. Yeah, I still have a chance. And um, yes, but uh, what struck me the most was he lived an amazing life. Like this beautiful emotional story about love, friendship, and so many things about what I had read about the books occurred or were instrumental in his own life. And it was such a touching story that was just a film that had to be made. And how did you personally get involved? I mean, the script was sent to you. Yes, it's a, it comes in the mailbox, usually the script. <laughs> and you have to open it and then often it's a code behind it. Like, you know, you really have to not a code of I have to read it and actually memorize it. But no, I actually jumped on, like, uh, after a while I was wondering, like, hey, do I, as a fan, do I have the right to make the film out of him? And uh, it took some time to decide that, that I, you know, looking from that lens and from a respectful lens towards the professor, um, I decided that I might be, hopefully, the best man to it. And then uh, we started rewriting, rewriting, and molding the film to be what it is. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we have our first exclusive clip. What do I mean? Well, Hell High Mountain is, or Hell Haven, is actually a place from the North, Norse mythology. It's a place where the warriors go to die if they haven't died, or actually they go after dying, post dying. And it is, for Tolkien, it's a very meaningful place because it comes out of something he loves the mythologies and the Nordic mythologies. And, uh, so this, they need a kind of row, cry or something, what to avoid in life, that you have to enjoy and fight in life and live the life to the fullest. And so it becomes their kind of passion route. I think we used it quite a lot in the day-to-day -day life as well. Yeah. Just an excuse to do stupid things. <laughs> you can't get away with it. You know, that was actually leading me to my next question. What was it like all working with these guys together? I mean, this motley crew, these troublemakers right here, how did you manage all this? I think it was the heaviest for Nick, so why don't you answer for that? The uh, heaviest in terms of... Yeah. I'm psychologically happy for you, I would assume. I think the special thing, um, talking from the character of Tolkien's perspective, um, you know, he was orphaned at such a young age that finding these guys and, and that relationship was really something that let him flourish um, and feel safe artistically. In fact, it gave him a place in the world, even though he wasn't necessarily from the same privileged background as them, it gave him somewhere to you know, be challenged artistically and also be inspired. So that the, this relationship is one of the most important ones in the movie, um, particularly since uh, through what transpires later on in, in World War I, um, he kind of loses all the, his fellowship. Um, and that's obviously painful, but he also has to then take on that idea of what, what they were trying to do together, which is change the world through art and what they create. And um, that's what's so important, that I think, to take away from this movie is the impact that art can have and, and what these, these guys have on Tolkien's life and the inspiration of that. Indeed, is it not a revolutionary idea for young people at that age, when they're 19, at college age, to bond together with these great ambitions? But the specific ambitions of this group became so foundational for Professor Tolkien. It was where he felt brave enough to attempt his first poetry, which led to everything else. Everything that he created was so personal and, and an escape for him, you know. Um, it was his secret world and those languages that he created meant everything to him. So to be able to, to share those and then have people critique them and improve them and work on them. And, you know, the tragic thing about um, these relationships is, yes, we very fortunately got Tolkien's work on the other side of the war and, and we're all, you know, blessed with that but at the same time. A lot of these guys didn't make it through that, either emotionally or, or physically. So it's one of those things where we also lost a lot of the great art that they could have created. And uh, to continue on that point is that these are young men, and we know how it is often we know as young men how lost we are when we wander. And, uh, and then to find this group of friends that inspire and also, how do you say, pump the life out of you, you know, just bring the energy out of you, find friendship and acceptance and find a belonging was very important and meaningful for him. Yeah, there was, some, there was something about the four of the TCBS members that were somewhat social outcasts, you know, and once they found that unit that was so secure and they could 
bounce ideas off each other and you know and kind of explore their intellectual curiosity as well with each other. That's a really safe place to be um, for four young men at that time in their life. You know, and that's what was so special and so secure about the TCBS. And they had no idea that the horrors of war were right on the corner. Of the now see, the contrast in the film between that optimism and what ultimately happens with the war is really where we're going. I love the meat and potatoes of that, that part of the story. But we'll also talk about the romance in just a moment. Thomas, can we roll the next clip, please, ladies and gentlemen? Let's go. Saying the same thing to Barry, saying, you can't go anywhere near my daughter. I see this, and it's amazing. Well, how much were you conscious of this? Uh, there's a lot of Easter eggs for those, I think, there are some obvious Easter eggs in the film that, you know, especially like if you just see maybe the movies, you can notice them. Uh, if you read the Silmarillion, which is where the Baron of the story is, and the story of King Pingo, of course, at the same time, there is this deeper ground. So, you know, if you're a true, true book fan, you find elements there. But I think, like, the more important it's layer of his life. All of his mythologies are somehow very easily tied into his life. As artists, we take inspiration of our own experiences. So not everything needs to be intentional. Because you, when you show his life, that was the big you know, revelation for me. You just make a film about his life, it feels like you're reading the book somehow. For me, the experience was for his better which is a beautiful love story. It's just, and it is the love story of Edith and Tolkien. And, uh, it's a beautiful that I cried when I first read it. I fell in love with Luthien in a way I, I didn't, you know, I fell in love with the thought of Edith Pratt also because she inspired that. When you when you put that in the film, it automatically there's a resonance into his mythologies. Now when I reread the books after you know doing the film, I actually find more elements and find more layers in his books and they perhaps even touch me more now. Speaking of the beautiful Lily Collins, Nick, what was it like working with such an evanescent beauty. <laughs> Awful, just awful. Pretty rubbish. <laughs> That's what I thought you said. Yeah, I mean, Lily has this wonderful, sparkling, like old movie star quality to okay. her. Um, and, and she also brings such intelligence to this character as well, where she, you can see completely where those stories of Baron and Luthien come from, um, and where that's inspired from, but also just... You know what was really lovely was, Dome was very brave, there's a, there's a scene between us in the middle of this movie, which is about seven pages long, where they both discuss language. And um, obviously that's Tolkien's passion. Um, Edith, Lily's character, kind of challenges on him on that and his ideas behind it. He says that a language isn't just beautiful because of the sound it makes, it's beautiful because of the history of it, which is something Professor Wright um, repeats later on in the movie. Um, and Dome was, normally in, in movies, you have a certain amount of time to tell a story, and scenes are quite perfunctory in many ways. Um, but Domi was insistent that this scene remained long and you got to sit with these characters and really feel that love and understand their relationship. And that was what was brilliant. You know, I got to do a, a brilliant scene with a brilliant actress and kind of set up that relationship, which is one of the core relationships of the movie. Celador. Celador. Yes, yeah, something beautifully said, sir. Now, this leads us up to the next clip. Because, unfortunately, Ms. Collins could not be here with us today. We have something quite special, do we not? Yes. Yeah, we, we have a special. We have a special video. To me, that artists have this kind of ambition. Professor Tolkien had an ambition that he thought was maybe a little bit over much to invent a mythology for England that he felt essentially was missing its own mythology, rooted in its own mother tongue, in its own languages. But to actually take a separate third-person view of his life and to take a real close look at all these factors and all these people involved in his mind and what a mind he had. I'm quite impressed with your ambition, may I say, and even taking on a project like this. And Nick, to, to, to be someone who idolizes Professor Tolkien and to step into his living shoes, I can't imagine. I can't. I'm very foolish. <laughs> well, better than silver spray paint in your mouth, right? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. But it's also like, it's not just about the idea that you do it as a fan, it's also like his story is a great cinematic experience in my life. Where when I read it, you know, it's very emotional and touching, so I don't necessarily see it in the story of the Prosef Prosef professor itself. In a way, I fantasize the thought that if I took out the name Tolkien, and I hope that it would work as a film without that even. 
at the same time it adds a flavor into that is a real life person but it is a story of a young man you know coming of age and finding love and finding friendship and going to war with these people and experiencing his own war mm -hmm. so in a way it's i think i hope and i know that uh, the professor was very gentle as a person i think he would uh, feel at least partly satisfied yes i can imagine no it's an extraordinary film and it's a, a feather in the cap in your hat for even making this it's beautifully done well done everyone and before we go to our first question from the audience i just want to say thank you very much for all of you for your time and for being here everyone thank these folks my question's for the cast it looks like you guys have developed a real fellowship of your own while making the movie i was just wondering if you were each a character in the fellowship of the rings who would you be uh -huh. Legolas, because he's really cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely Gimli because that's the, that's that's who I played in the PS2 game for a bit. <laughs> that's the one. I, I mean, when I was a kid, I always wanted to go up to be Aragorn. Yeah, Aragorn's so sick. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to be Gimli as well. Did any of you guys play the video game, the, the Two Towers? Did you ever see we had to fight the giant squid and he was through his little axes? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> That's spoken like a true fan. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yes. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Dome. Who would you like to be? Oh, um, so, Aragorn, of course, is uh, one of the Dunaidan, which is a Numenorean. They're tall and they're magnificent and live long and they kind of. Uh, so, I, I want to be those. And I, you know, I dream of being a Gandalf, but my sister always tells us I'm a hobbit and really a truck. <laughs> she was always laughing that, hey, I can't watch you eat because you devour food. <laughs> like, eat three breakfasts. And uh, there's a bit of an adventurous side in me, so those who know the Took family has that uh, tendency to go on an adventure. Very good. Now, for our next question. May I say that I am so fangirled out that this looks so beautifully handled. The way that you filmed it, it just really looks like you do him a great homage. And I appreciate that. Um, what I wanted to ask was, there was a lot of Christianity, spirituality that drove Tolkien, and how did you handle that in the film? It is, that's a very good question because uh, Catholicism was a very instrumental element in his life. Those who don't know, he was a devout Catholic and his mother turned into Catholicism and that caused a bit of a stir in the family. So we do, we do touch the uh, time. And Father Francis is a lovable, wonderful character. <laughs> so after his parents passed away, Father Francis, his Catholic priest, became his guardian. And he was an amazing fellow. And as we portray him in the film with kindness, because everything you read about Father Francis, he would have deserved his own film. You know, yes. he was uh, a gentle, and we often see Catholic priests as being, you know, harsh and perhaps not more negative in a societal manner. But Father Francis was everything else. He was what a, I think Catholic priest could be for a young, growing man like Tolkien. And uh, Colmini plays Father Francis, so the Star Trek, the Star Trek fans, maybe. Yes. yes. Right, Star Trek veteran uh, Colin Meany is wonderful as Father Francis. Um, uh, yeah, young, young Hillary, thank you so much for your question. Thank you. Young Hillary Tolkien and Ronald Tolkien had a very tough time in their early, early childhood, did they not? Well, yeah, they were, they were orphaned at such a young age, lost both of their parents. Um, but then they were put into care, and I mean, a lot of good came out of that because that's where um, Tolkien met needed. Um, and and Fr Father Francis did take great care of him. Um, although at times it did mean that he could have been with Edith when he wanted to be, they had to take a break and whilst he finished his studying and, and went to Oxford and completed that part of his life as well. So, you know, there was contention between them at moments, obviously, as, uh, as a young man as you would be if you were told you couldn't be with, with the person that you loved. Um, Unless you go and cut three silver rolls from the crown of Morgoth, <laughs> then you can have her hand and do that help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, uh, yeah, we... Uh, touch upon in his, his religious aspects of his life okay. and the Father Francis relationship and how that influenced him as a young man. Excellent. Right, next question. 
Hi everybody, um, so my name is Brian, and I've always been very interested in films based off real people's lives, and, uh, especially when you get a chance to work with really meaningful primary sources, either the person themselves or family members or dear friends, things like that. So I just wanted to ask, what were your most meaningful sources for the film to keep it really accurate if they were people, biographies, places you went, like the pub, things like that? <laughs> I actually had a book that Jeffrey wrote and it was published posthumously by Tolkien and it was a book of poetry and I sort of used that as uh, the bible for the character, just sort of thought in what situations would he have written these poems, uh, what would be going on in his life to employ him to have written these things, um, so that was just, that was my sort of core, that was my sort of textbook. Yeah, I mean this book right here was, was very handy. Um, and then it was really, yeah. <laughs> you could buy it in all good stores. Uh, Rereading Tolkien's work alongside biographies, watching videos and interviews of him, listening to recordings of him, um, and, then, and then doing things that, I mean, I would try and copy like paintings that he had done. You've got. To actually, have a picture of him wearing his beast mask <laughs> and drawing and drawing like I mean, making have just finished an illustration of like Tolkien. So basically, when he's been sitting in X Men four hours in the makeup, he's been drawing a Tolkien illustration of a dragon. And oh, yeah. it's amazing. I mean, when he was in his Oscar one day, I can you know ransom. Like, <laughs> That's extraordinary. Very few people realize, or maybe the, the hardcore fans know, but Professor Tolkien was the greatest watercolorist and illustrator that, he, that was around him, and the publishers knew it. They asked the professor to illustrate his own covers and dust jackets for the books. Also drawing the maps as well. The yeah. ones that he would create, and then when it would come down to the details of where characters could be, he would know how long it would take them to travel from this point to this point, and if it made sense within the story that they could have done that to save the day or whatever it might have been. So. The dancer Brian, I think, uh, it's a very good question because I've done a couple of films of real life people and the first and foremost you're doing it for yourself. As a second, you're doing hopefully for the respect of the character. So I just dig, I mean, my method is basically just dig everything, read everything. I read this book, I read all the biographies I found, I read all the material that he's, he's written, try to analyze the trailers, the illustrations, because that also tells something about how you illustrate, how you hold, I went to art school, how you hold a pencil, or how you hold a brush. It tells you something about the character, your temperament, or the elements. And then you find your own interpretation of the character. And that's what this film is, it's ours. It's, our interpretations of these characters. I found that, um, for, like, es essentially what we did was we had a structure uh, given to us by all these letters that the, the, the real people wrote, and um, you know the conversations that were that were noted down and things like that. But that that was a structure. We we weren't doing impressions of these people. We we were given the creative license to bring breath to these characters, our own take on them and create them for ourselves, what we thought they would be. Um, and I found that really liberating and Domi was great and sort of allowing us to have that space to be creative and imaginative and make some crazy decisions now and again, be really bold with a few, you know, a few choices and maybe they didn't work so we tone it down, but we had that freedom to, to breathe life into them, um, which was great. I, I'd, I'd feel very restricted if there was a... Uh, there was an idea that we were doing impressions of these, these people, because especially for Christopher, there, there wasn't there wasn't that much material that I could find that he had produced himself. It was it was through letters by Robert, by Robert, and by Jeffrey, and by talking himself. Um, so yeah, yeah, the, the freedom to be creative was, was very liberating in that sense. And I was quite lucky. I had uh, Robert had written letters um, for a large portion of his life. Every, almost every day uh, from when he was in university um, right up until he was uh, fighting in, in the First World War and you get this, he, he had an amazing eye for detail and, and uh, he sort of notes down the things that he was doing that day but he also had a real like emotional clarity as to what, what was happening and um, I was always blown away by, it's probably a terrible choice of words considering I'm talking about the war, but I was... Um, always ignore the fact that he was able to sort of see the beauty um, in the war and, and sort of look at the gunshots as if they were fireworks rather than 
now something terrible. And I think that's even reflected in, in uh, the scene with the Gandalf mm -hmm. and, and Frodo. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No. <laughs> one quick side question before we go to our next guest. Did you guys get to visit the eagle and child? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, the bird and baby. Yeah, we were talking about it before where we go hat and toasted to the toast of the boys and yeah, you did that. We, all got the, we all got the pints in and um, yeah, it was quite a... But they spoke with a weird English accent so nobody gets it. <laughs> yeah, it's my accent probably. Not many your accent. Um, yeah, no, we definitely did that. That was that was one of the that was one of the great moments of that process. Yes, I must see. I must see. No, yes. So those who don't know, Eagle and Child was basically his hangout, and that's a place with with seals and Lewis. They would, you know, have a pint, talk about elves, and discussion with seals. Seals Lewis would spar him, try to get be the next uh, his kind of next life, pro uh, post war. Yeah, his next life, perhaps you could say, his next. Tea Club Barovian Society would be the Inklings themselves, the next group of writers and artists who would support Tolkien there in his later life in Oxford. Um, let's have our next question, please. Hi, my name is Kelsey. Thank you so much for coming here today. Um, this is a question for the cast. Did you guys have any notable shenanigans while you were filming? Any pranks that you put on each other? <laughs> Comment. We do have to work again after this. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we had we had a great time, and it was it was really important that we did that. So the great thing about having an ensemble like us is, or, or, or any project you work on where there's an ensemble um, cast or feel to it, is that if you get the chance to establish a rapport between the cast. You're doing half the work when the camera starts rolling because it's natural, it's within you somehow. You've, 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 uh, you've established a thread between you, an understanding of who people are and what sort of sense of humor they have, where, what kind of jokes you can play on them, and there were plenty of those. And then, uh, so yeah, you, you just, there is there's just this spark that is, um, hopefully is, is translated through the, through the movie. There was also something that Dome did that was really smart that was um, he got us with the younger versions of our characters and we worked on mannerisms and, and things that patterns of speech, whatever it would be, to carry through so that when there's that age jump between the younger versions and our versions of the characters, it's kind of a smooth transition. Um, so that was a great piece of directed by him. Very clever. I concur. They were probably more like rambunctious than us. Yeah. The thing is that the, the happens, it's a really good question, it happens so many crazy stuff and pranks and elements, but then like a year later you just forget them. <laughs> because you kind of want to forget that dark past. <laughs> and have to erase them from your memory. <laughs> what, what new devilry is this? You guys, I can tell, I can tell by Anthony's look that there was some mischief going on. Staying very quiet, Anthony. Very mischief. Mischief. Yeah. mischief. There was a lot, but I think, you know, I remember one scene uh, where we were playing billiards, and we like, I mean, it was just, I mean, the focus was not there, but like, it, it just, it felt like we were just having a lot of fun, and it felt like just four lads messing around, and I, I thought to myself, that, you know, when we watch this back, it'll just look like four lads messing around, and it'll look awful, but when I saw it, it looks amazing, because it's real, you know, and all of us were just, you know, messing around, which is great. Excellent. Fidelity. Fidelity to life. Our next question. Hi, Cliff. My name is Laurel. Long time tour fan. Lovely to have you here. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, my question is for everyone on the cast. I know for most of us here who are Tolkien fans, there's a moment in the books um, that just strikes. There's a reason that we get our teeth into it, and I wonder what that moment might have been for you guys. I know my moment was sitting on a metal bridge over a creek out the back of my yard, and I'm reading Galadriel's lament that she's never going to see the world the way that she once knew it, and just bawling my eyes out while I'm watching the sunset, and Tolkien had made it in that moment on. So what was that for you guys? Well, for me, sorry, for me it wasn't a particular moment, it was, it was what the, it was what Tolkien's work overall did to me, and that was, that was kind of a, it was an escape. He created a world that you could dive into and forget everything that was going on in your life at that time. You were there. You were, you know, you were 
running with the you running with the wind like other characters were kind of thing. And you were you could, you could feel it was so the senses. He was so good with how he brought the senses through his writing. Um, and that for me, like like a lot of fantasy, you know, it just just allows you to find that escape. You can dream. You can um, kind of fly away with the story. It's actually uh, for me when I was reading the first Lord of the Rings. And, uh, I was very heavily bullied, so I was very heavily bullied from the age of seven until 14. And I was, you know, a loner, loner and kind of an outsider. And I had the same thing as uh, Tom said, that there was an escape going in this world, you know, feeling very heroic yourself, being part of that journey. And I remember crying when, you know, Sam utters his last line at the end of The Return of the King, you know, I'm home. I just remember crying. A, a it's a beautiful scene, but to it ended. I was I was kind of like at the same time like I had escaped you know my own misery at that time, and then this story just ended. And then two years later, I realized that Tolkien had this amazing way of finishing the stories in kind of the midst of a scene. Like the Hobbit ends in a beautiful, very simple scene of Bilbo sitting with Gandalf and Bali, and it's there's nothing glamorous there. It's about life and it's about a great journey and experience you've had with the author, with the books, and as the characters have it. That was my like, moment of uh, greatest moment. Uh, I think mine was playing the PlayStation 2 game. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. <laughs> the, um, you know what, I mean, I love the, the, the darker, more epics, epic moments of the stories later on, but um, certainly just the little dwarves arriving at the beginning. Hobbit. It makes me chuckle, it sets up that dynamic, kind of the adventure being taken out of their hands and, and that fun before the darkness ensues. I was, I was completely on board from that moment. And also it ends, I mean, his relationship with nature and trees and everything, but the character, you know, making that come to life in my imagination was completely believable. It was, uh, you know, it obviously shows how skilled he is as a writer. But the man who actually gave voice to nature, again, a very specific and ancient, powerful voice, Treebeard, I'm with you, that's what got me, and that's why for 20 years on Wondering.net, my nickname online has been Quickbeam, was the young aunt, was a young friend of Treebeard, but yeah, this, this relationship with nature is something that, that late 20th century writers did not give us much of, Tolkien in abundance gave us a lot of, of well-reasoned and powerful emotional impetus for us to recognize our relationship with nature and nature's relationship with us. So that got me as well. Yeah, well said. Well said. Our next question.